it can be produced by an artist, but if it doesn't start out as a private, uh, let's say, ownership, then I would say that the public art is not successful or not as successful. Um, it doesn't possess the, the, the art or the image within, this, within the artist. So the work that's here is privately conceived, I would think. And um, what a beautiful show it is because of that. Um, so I'm interested in art hitting a market need. And when it's private, it's an internal market need, a desire. Um, I, I would say it, it's um, exercising delight. Or it also could be uh, exorcising demons getting rid of uh, um, um, internal struggle. Um, public art is the same way. Uh, public art can delight, and public art can also be demonic in terms of the imagery. Um, and it serves different purposes. Public art tends to be more, um, there's a whole category that fits into historical interpretation. And that tends to be more contractual, like the artist is their contract. Um, for me, the public art I've done that I've been contracted to do, like Neptune, for example, um, had a, I had a personal attachment to the imagery and the, the message I wanted <coughs> Neptune to carry or exercise in a delightful way. So, um, the light demons, that's things that kind of comes up in this. Um, but I thought I'd start with this slide, which is uh, 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 this installation, this hair installation, was done by a friend of mine named Terry Needslack. And I just wanted to give a couple of examples before I talk about my work and some of the work here. Um, Terry was a hairdresser. Uh, she dropped out of school, was pregnant in high school, got her got a degree in Hair. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, got a GED. Went to went to community college. Um, by the way, I'm really um, uh, put a plug in for Reynolds Community College here tonight. Um, the president is here. Thank you for being here. And single-handedly is collecting, creating a collection of art for uh, Jay Sargent Reynolds. We have a new full-time position curator sitting right. Uh, excellent. Um, um, so, let's see. Wait a minute. What was I? Where was I? <laughs> so she got lit up about art while she was at community college and started doing hair installations. And um, and then the next slide shows just one of many that she created. Um, and she would take this to high schools and get high school students excited doing hair installations. And of course, it would send out a public service announcement. The press would come in. It's eminently photographical. And it would end up in the paper. And she started doing, um, doing this on the road. Um, and eventually, the next slide shows uh, where it ended up on the cover of Vogue. Um, she gained notoriety. So it was a very personal, private kind of art form, specific to what she was good at. And um, it, it's just a lovely example of this private going public um, and in a performance kind of art, temporary kind of art. The next slide shows somebody else who was uh, interested in, in hair and probably personally delighted in it. So um, anytime I can do a slideshow and show Michelangelo's work and compare it to mine and count me in. Um, but the next slide shows one of his inventions. This is his drawing and this is the actual um, uh, working drawing of a, of a bicycle that would work. The chain, however, would be made out of wood. Um, so a personal kind of foray into the invention, art as invention. Next slide 
of course, is um, one of his first pieces, really what made him um, people take note. And if you don't know this about the Pieta, um, across Mary's chest is a, is a strap, a leather strap, represents a leather strap in marble, of course. And on it, it says, I, Michelangelo, made this. And he carved that in the strap the night before this piece was unveiled to the Pope. Had he not done that, the studio and the master of the studio, the maestro of the studio, would have taken credit for the piece. When he did that, um, it broke all the rules. But what it did, but the studio, the Pope loved the piece. The studio couldn't fire him if the Pope loves the piece. And he made this major step in the public art um, by doing that. So a very, uh, very private uh, an example of that kind of um, dedication to work being stepping into the public is how I see that piece. Um, the next slide, another piece of my plan was, I, um, of course, the day that, if you, if you haven't seen it, it's worth going to Florence to see. It's worth going to Florence anyway, yeah. but uh, do see it, uh, put it on your bucket list. But I, I do like to show this slide, particularly when I'm uh, doing any lectures at high schools, because, um, I like to talk about the difference between nudity and nakedness. And the difference is, if you don't have clothes on, you're nude. Um, so artists sculpt and paint nudes. If you don't have clothes on and you're embarrassed, or if you look at a sculptor that is a, a nude and you're embarrassed, then you think it's naked. Or if you're embarrassed that you don't have clothes on, you're naked. That's the difference. So I like to explain that. When I get the opportunity. <laughs> the next slide is uh, is a sculpture of mine, um, and I just wanted to show you this because it, it, my other other work that brackets this has been in uh, museum shows. This one doesn't get to be in the show because if you're five feet six or taller, you can see over the edge of this bathtub. And the imagery is. Fernando, or Hero, is staring at his toe, which is kind of puckered up because he's been in the bathtub too long. And the toe has grown legs from ball and claw feet, and it's walking away. And Fernando is oblivious to all this. He's looking at his toe. So it's kind of a self-portrait in that way. But um, where it's not self-portrait is Fernando's eight feet tall, and he stood up. And anatomically, it's in proportion. So if you look up over the edge and all you're interested in is him being naked, then you're going to be surprised. And consequently, because he's average to his size, he may be tall. So the next slide, and the next slide shows a kind of modest version of what Hernando looks like without his tub. But of course, the tub is integral to the, uh, to the sculpture. Well, part of the tub was like wood in that first picture. Was it, was it wood or was it all yeah. different? The next slide shows um, one more carving that. Uh, so it was laminated uh, clear uh, fur, two by sixes, and carved. And then it shows uh, that is me, by the way. This is an old slide. <laughs> oh, my. Anyway, uh, so yeah, but it. it it's one piece. You're looking at your toe? <laughs> Are you nude or naked? <laughs> I did have pants on. <laughs> Next slide. spice up his parties. <laughs> <laughs>
had certain limits that I was able to, not more than 200 people, you can't get to sell alcohol or give it away. And I, I selected the site right opposite the Hirshhorn, which is what Bob was talking about. And um, so people came out of the Hirshhorn, and here's this sculpture of an eight foot tall um, white guy in a bathtub that's growing legs from ball and claw feet. It was a little difficult not to come up and try to look in the tub, or at least look at it. Um, but we did have a stool in case people wanted to, uh, where shorter people wanted to self-edit what they saw. Uh, that's what I was but the most enjoyable part of all was watching people as they as they approached it. They would sort of look around to see if anybody was looking. It was a two-step stool, and they would step up the two steps and then watch them just stand back and watch the expressions on people's faces as they looked down. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Mary, come look at this. <laughs> anyway, here's a young man who is, you know, he's never seen anything like it. And, um, but it's, it's really, the reason I made this piece uh, was it, it started as a private effort to, um, to work with the, the nude figure in a modern context, but also um, it's, uh, I like the message. Pay attention. As much as I can, I try to. Next slide. Um, you know, transporting sculptures always interesting. <clears throat> that was my friend who was just out of law school who handled it well um, on the way to the Hirshhorn shop, so to speak. Uh, the next slide shows um, an early avatar in 1983, a nine foot tall, blue skinned dancer who's holding on to a bar, as in doing an arabesque. However, the bar is sharpened at the end, so it's kind of a javelin. So that's also what you do when you are throwing a javelin. And the next slide shows that you can see here that she's five months pregnant, or you might believe it, looking at this slide. And that was the intention. Here's oh, the modern woman who is, um, she's, uh, hunting or bringing home bacon. She's doing art in the form of dance, and uh, she is um, keeping the species going by having children. Um, and it's blue because of the deity reference, and, um, and usually it was um, modeled after my fiance, who was not pregnant at the time. And when the piece was finished, she was five months pregnant, so a clear <laughs> case of life imitating art. Next slide shows um, me figuring out after the Hirshhorn show that if I had a show the same night that, it, that the Corcoran Gallery was letting out a sculpture show, people would come across the street and see this sculpture. So I erected a wall, and um, the next slide shows um, the, tele the two television stations in Washington showing up because I sent out a public service announcement about a nine foot tall blue skin uh, Diana being unveiled this night. And, um, and then the next slide shows uh, me getting to go on television endorsing it as a great work of art. <laughs> and with that, um, it took me another, next slide shows um, plans to do um, what's commonly known as the braid because he ended up at the Richmond Braves Stadium. But this was the original site. Um, Connecticut Avenue this way, Calvert Street this way, Adams Morgan over here, and downtown Washington here. And as I drove by this two-story building with a four-story building behind it and a six-story um, apartment building behind that, this site drove this piece. This concept it was um, it's a personal, private, interest in putting organic or figurative element in a geometric or architectural setting, that the buildings would um, show that. <coughs> and um, what should go there? And it really came up, up quickly because there were no Native Americans in the capital of America. It, it was, that became my business model, the hook, if you will. And if in 1981, when I 
started this piece, um, the, the press couldn't resist it. Ultimately, the press could resist it, much like to come see the blue-skinned, nine-foot lady across from the courtroom. Um, I contacted the owner of this building, and I built this model. And this is an early uh, Photoshop, simply by taking two slides and putting them together, taking a, a picture of that. Um, but the next slide shows um, me building the model. Here's the model of the building. And I brought this down to the building owner and showed it to him and said, I would like to um, put this on your roof for a period of six months. If you agree to that, I'll insure your roof and um, it'll make a landmark out of your building. And he believed that. At least we agreed on it. <laughs> and uh, so the next slide shows um, the, the model. And the next slide shows the reality. What year did you do that? So it was finished in 1983. 83. And, um, but you'll notice it's on top of a Best Products building, the finished piece. So the next slide shows building it. Here's the model. Just, just out of interest, there's the nose of the model. And here's the nose of the uh, one, one inch equals one foot. Uh, um, pointing up, if you will, this uh, sculpture. Mm -hmm. So, and it's just, it's a space structure out of strips of lumber that are um, taped together with nylon tape. And then the next slide shows spraying a foam on it, um, isocyanate foam that sets up in about 20 seconds. It can be carved, and then if too much is carved, you can add more, just like clay. And uh, it can be sanded. And the next slide shows, well, actually, yeah, I'll tell you what the process is after I tell you that I ran out of money. So I'd say, I, by the way, quit my full-time teaching job at Northern Virginia Community College to do this piece. Um, that's how obsessed I was with doing it. That's how personal it was in terms of the private vision of this being worthy and needed. Um, but in order to make more money, I did this print uh, in an edition of 50, and if you bought one, I would, uh, for $200, when I sold the sculpture, I'd give you your $200 back. I called it an etching dividend. And people believed that. <laughs> so um, in a week, I got um, 50 checks. In one week, for uh, $200 each, or $10,000. And I had to send back about six checks. Um, and then, the next slide, the next slide. Um, so the Washington Post picked it up and wrote about it, put this picture of me sitting on the sculpture in my studio, which was a four-car garage uh, in behind my apartment in Washington, D.C. Unbeknownst to me, they sold it to the New York Times. And when you get a, your, a story in the New York Times, your name in the New York Times, everybody wants to talk to you. in the spirit of Arthur Ashe, which was the charge of the commission. And, um, and he's nude, in case you haven't noticed. He is without clothes and um, not embarrassed. At, at any rate, um, the, I haven't seen this piece in person, but the critics write about it. It's anatomically complete, but not accurate. So uh, it moves from being kind of uh, earthen, uh, and as it goes up, it becomes more anatomically accurate. But this piece, unlike the Ash statue, once it was unveiled, continues to generate controversy. People want to take it down. Which is not to say that there still isn't controversy about the Ash monument. The next slide shows um, your very Richmond if your favorite monument is Arthur Ashe because it proves Richmond isn't racist done by Style Magazine. Kind of a backhanded compliment, if you, you know. But, uh, you know, Arthur Ashe looks like he's beating the children with a tennis racket. And I say, art is what you bring to it. 
The next slide refers to that. <laughs> you know, so, um, so public art um, gets, uh, gets people excited and some people brings out their sense of humor uh, or their demons. And, and that's, I think, what happened with Arthur Ashe. Um, so, next slide, and we'll try to pick it up because you're all being very patient. Nobody's walked out yet. Um, so we're going to speed it up. But I, there was this competition to do Neptune, and the site was the ocean, the sand, and the sky. And there couldn't be a better site. Uh, you can't buy that real estate to, to put a sculpture on. Um, so I submitted a, a proposal. The next slide. Um, this shows what they wanted. Here's, that's, um, our, that's Virginia Beach Boulevard, this new park where the, um, the uh, amusement park used to be. It's gonna be a new Hilton. They're gonna make Neptune Park, and here's the beach, and here's the ocean, and they wanted a statue of Neptune. They wanted it 15 feet high on 12 feet of, um, of rock, of a base. And so I designed it 15 feet from the waist up kind of the same size as Connecticut, because I liked working that size. And uh, of course, that meant it needed a bigger base. And mine was three times the volume of anybody else's who did Neptune 15 feet from foot to head, you see? So by doing it this much, it, it, it increased the size by two, but the volume by three. If that doesn't make sense, then we'll have to have a sculpture discussion after. Okay, the next slide shows um, a drawing. <laughs> the next slide shows um, Neptune as he exists. Oh, yeah, that's right, keep going. Um, that's as he is today, and the next slide shows my model. So you'll notice that my model's a little skinnier. Go back one if you would. Um, Neptune's a little broader here, and that's because um, we had him cast in China, and the head of the foundry, before I got there, wanted to impress the American, and he made Neptune broader. He made him 14 feet at the shoulders instead of 12. The problem is, now he wouldn't fit in a shipping container. <laughs> so I had to cut his head off. I had to cut him off at the ribs. I couldn't make him little. It was an 80-ton clay, um, full-scale statue on dry laid brick, which was another you know, 80 tons. So we, we couldn't back up at that point. Just keep that in mind. And I don't speak Chinese. And it's not our Chinese. Anyway, I'm glad to be standing here talking with you all tonight. The next slide shows, uh, oh, keep going, sorry. The model again, the next slide. So this is the model that's out in fiberglass. It's the proof statue. And I did that in China um, because I wanted to have something to compare to the clay, which had, it's been fixed here, but it had, the pose had been changed as well as being bigger. So, um, but this is the fiberglass one. And I just uh, thought that was, I like that slide. Here's, here's um, one of the four sculptures sitting on the shoulder. It looks like he's on this one's shoulder. He's sitting on the arm this one. Um, work out. Um, the next slide, uh, 80 tons of clay. Uh, the next slide, oh, sorry about that. Oh, there we go. Um, everything's in clay. The octopus is in clay. The dolphins are in clay. And um, my, my job was to get it right and then say, okay, do it this way. So I didn't, I only had to do one tentacle not seven more, and things like that. Um, but you get a flavor of what the foundry looked like. The 20 workers who came there brought their families and built plywood structures in the airplane hangar, which was the foundry with the dirt floor, and you know, hung their wash up um, while they were working. Um, more on that later, maybe. Next slide. Um, is pouring um, pretty much this mold 
uh, with two men on either side of 150 pounds of um, molten bronze at about 2200 degrees. Um, and there's three teams. And so they would, they would get a charge from the, uh, the large cauldron and they would do this kind of ballet up for it and then continue down the other side and come around while the other two were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And for this event, the foundry issued um, um, those corduroy foam sole uh, bedroom slippers, you know, so to replace the flip flops. If people were wearing flip flops, you don't want to pour that and bronze flip flops. Much better to have corduroy. In there. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. What part of China was it? Yeah, in China. Where so this was, the question is where in China, and this was in Ningbo, which is a, a little uh, city of about 8 million across from Shanghai, across the bay from Shanghai, which is 20 million, 22 million. Yeah, 22 million, yeah. People. Um, so this is just, that's the chest, and we're carving out the core uh, part, uh, we, they are carving out the core. Uh, the next slide. Uh, and so we got 17 pieces that we had to weld together at the beach, as opposed to three, which was the original plan. But we had to cut it up into all those pieces. Um, the next slide. So Paul, if you didn't speak Chinese and you had all these workers, how did that work? Um, there, I had worked for Evergreen Enterprises, which is a Chinese-American um, uh, company in Midlothian. And they became the middleman, and I, and I stayed uh, with at their factory, and they assigned a uh, translator, Joan, who was about uh, five feet tall, and um, we would work late into the night and um, take a motorcycle taxi cab back. It's a five-mile trip, and so the driver would be here, and I'd be holding onto the driver like this because I'm on the back. And Joan is here. <laughs> That's how we rolled. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I lost tools on one trip because we went over a bump and they bounced out of my, you know, <laughs>